With this introduction, may I please pass the floor to my good friend Max, who will surely have more things to say. And Max, can I kindly ask you to, uh, to make it as lively as possible? Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Well, it's now 10 years since the financial crisis. And during that period, the general narrative has been that it was the free market which caused the financial crisis and that decisive central bank action in the form of 0% interest rates and massive money creation through quantitative easing revived the dying patient. Yet actually, if we look at the fundamentals over the last few years, a different picture emerges. In 2008, global aggregate debt levels uh, were around $150 trillion. Uh, and people were saying at the time, that this was the largest debt bubble in human history. And since then, with a decade of 0% interest rates, global aggregate debt now has gone from 150 to $250 trillion, really with no appreciable rise in living standards for most people. But as well as the efficacy, uh, the ethics of some of this radical monetary policy has also come into question, uh, with more and more papers showing that, for instance, uh, of all the trillions of dollars and euros that have been created through QE, the majority of it has flowed to the very wealthiest. And some of this commentary has even come from within the central banking establishment. So, for instance, the Bank for International Settlements, which is essentially the central bank of central banks, uh, has wrote several papers on how the situation is worse now than it was in 2008. Uh, Bill White, who's the chief economist of the OECD, has reiterated this, saying that a fundamental problem is a debt problem, and it's worse now than it was during the financial crisis. Claudio Borio, who is the chief monetary economist at the Bank for International Settlements, uh, provided a quote which will be useful for us today. He said, if we wish to look for clues to the deeper forces at work, we need to go beyond the market's all too familiar oscillation between hope and fear. Debt was at the root of the financial crisis and, has, and it has risen further globally in relation to GDP since then. So today I'm gonna to talk through some ideas relating to what Borio calls these deeper forces at work, specifically with reference to the Austrian School of Economics. And actually both Bill White uh, from the OECD and Borio have cited uh, Austrian school economists in their work. So to understand the Austrian school, if we first start with the idea that uh, pretty much all mainstream economics understands the importance of prices. So very few economists these days would recommend setting up government committees of bureaucrats to set the prices in an economy, the price of coffee, the price of clothing, and so on and so on. We've seen this attempted, of course, in various economies over the last few decades. Uh, we see it now in Venezuela, for instance, where the government sets the prices of goods, and we see empty shelves in the supermarkets, and we see mass hunger. This actually goes back a lot further. Um, Emperor Diocletian in the late Roman Empire passed the Edict of Diocletian, which set prices throughout ancient Rome. Now, at the time, thinkers such as Lactantius pointed out in advance the problems that would be caused by this price fixing. Uh, and they were shown to be correct. It caused havoc for the economy of ancient Rome and made things far worse. Now, thankfully, as I said, very few economists these days recommend these kinds of price fixing policies for an economy. Yet there is still one area where systemic price fixing is really part of the economics establishment, and that is central banks setting interest rates. Now, many of you here today will be familiar with the work of Friedrich von Hayek. Uh, his book, The Road to Serfdom, sold millions of copies and was one of the best-selling political books of the 20th century. Yet actually, he won his Nobel Prize in 1974 uh, for his work on how central banks setting interest rates distorts the economy. So fun the fundamental idea is that interest rates, like other prices in the economy, should be set by the market rather than by committees of economists and bureaucrats. 
So if we think about the case of food, for instance, when the government steps in and sets the price of food lower than it should be, uh, what happens is more people demand food than there actually is available. Uh, and it also disrupts the supply chain, so fewer people will be providing it because it's less profitable due to these artificially low prices. So essentially what happens is when the government sets prices, artificial prices, it sends the wrong signals to the market. Uh, so for instance, in the case of food, if they set the price too low, it gives the illusion of abundance because lower prices generally indicate that something is becoming more abundant. Now, in a true free market, interest rates would be set by the amount of savings and the demand for borrowing in an economy. So in other words, if more people are saving, that will bring down the interest rate as there's more savings available for borrowers. Uh, conversely, if people want to borrow a lot, then that pushes up the interest rate, uh, which then has a couple of effects. First of all, it makes saving more attractive. So that saving is then provided uh, for, for that extra borrowing. But also, that rise in interest rates dampens the demand for debt. Uh, so in other words, interest rates, like other prices in the economy, uh, have a fundamental role in allocating scarce resources. Now, when central banks step in and set interest rates, it distorts this market, just like it does with setting the price of food or anything else. So in essence, when a central bank sets interest rates artificially low, uh, more debt is created than is justified by the amount of savings and resources in the economy. Uh, so in other words, these artificial prices, uh, in this case interest rates, uh, similar to other forms of, of artificial prices, send the wrong signals to the market. They give the illusion of abundance, in this case of savings. So a recent example would be the housing bubble in the US. Uh, the Federal Reserve set interest rates at 1% through 2003 and 2004, and consequently more houses were built than was justified by the amount of savings and the underlying resources in the economy. Uh, so in other words, from that point on, the bust was inevitable. Uh, Ludwig von Mises, who, uh, as Olympios said, is one of the key figures within the Austrian School of Economics, uh, provided the following quote. Uh, he said, true, governments can reduce the rate of interest in the short run. They can issue additional paper money. They can open the way to credit expansion by the banks. They can thus create an artificial boom and the appearance of prosperity. But such a boom is bound to collapse sooner or later and to bring about a depression. Uh, in the late 1920s, there was a famous economist called Irving Fisher, uh, who, who predicted, he said that the, the stock market and the economy had, had, quote, reached what looks like a permanently high plateau. Uh, but at the, around the same time, in the late 1920s, uh, Ludwig von Mises was offered a prestigious job at Credit Anstalt Bank which was the largest bank in Austria and one of the largest banks in Europe. He turned down this job, saying that the world was headed for a depression uh, as a result of the artificially low interest rates set by central banks during the 1920s. And of course, we all know what happened in 1929 and the years that followed. And so relating this to our current problems, essentially for an entire generation now, uh, we've had lower and lower interest rates. For, for the last generation, with every recession, central banks cut interest rates. And then after the recession, they raised them, but not quite back to where they were before. So there's a ratchet effect with lower and lower interest rates. And essentially, the economy becomes more and more dependent on this artificially cheap credit. So it becomes like a, like a drug stimulus, where you need a more powerful dose of cheap credit every time to keep the economy going. Uh, last year, I gave a seminar at the OECD headquarters in Paris on the Austrian School of Economics, and they said this actually tallies with a lot of their findings in terms of productivity uh, and so-called zombie companies and this type of thing as well. Essentially, much of the economy is now addicted to artificially cheap credit. Uh, now, as I said, the, the last uh, boom-bust cycle created by cheap credit was the housing, uh, the housing bubble in the US and elsewhere. But this time around, um, with 0% with interest rates and trillions in QE. Uh, there's bubbles in, in stocks, bonds, housing, uh, and really throughout the economy. 
But nevertheless, a lot of it has coagulated in the bond markets. Uh, actually, Andrew Haldane, who is the chief economist at the Bank of England, uh, when he was speaking at the Treasury Select Committee in the UK, uh, actually said, and I, I'll quote this word for word, we have intentionally blown the biggest, bond, the biggest government bond bubble in history. And Andy Haldane actually went on to say that a disorderly bursting of this enormous bond bubble uh, was the greatest risk to global financial stability. But of course, from the perspective of the Austrian School of Economics, it's creating these bubbles that's the greatest risk to financial stability. In other words, it's the 0% interest rates that create these bubbles. Once that's happened, the bust is simply inevitable. An economist who is influential for the Austrian school, who's useful for looking, looking at these issues, uh, is Richard Cantillon, who actually wrote during the 18th century about monetary economics. And the eponymous Cantillon effect essentially says that when new money is created, uh, the receivers of that newly created money benefit disproportionately. So in the days of Cantillon, it was the French royal court. And the people surrounding the French royal court would receive newly created money, which they could then spend and invest into the economy. So they, they, for instance, could buy property with this newly created money, but then once that new money flows around the economy, prices will go up. So they benefit. Uh, so in essence, there's actually uh, they, those, the, that locus of new money creation starts to pull in resources from the rest of the economy as a result of this effect. Now, if we look at a 21st century economy, it's not the royal court, it's central banks, uh, and it's the financial institutions surrounding them that benefit. So when new money is created through 0% interest rates or through quantitative easing, uh, for instance, hedge funds can leverage up massively uh, at 50 to 1, uh, far in excess uh, than they could do if it was a free market where, where borrowing had to be funded through existing savings. So this artificially cheap credit is essentially a subsidy which makes these financial institutions artificially profitable. So when you hear about, for instance, uh, top physicists and mathematicians going to work for hedge funds and other financial institutions rather than doing something productive. That is, in essence, a kind of Cantillon effect. All of this new money creation is allowing those institutions to pull resources from other more productive sectors of the economy because they benefit from all of this newly created money. So sometimes people ask, well, with all of these trillions created, why hasn't there been inflation? Well, one of the answers is, uh, where has that money gone? Uh, and of course, a hedge fund manager, for instance, who makes $50 million this year, uh, doesn't go out and buy 50 million packets of crisps. So those kind of prices in the shops aren't going up. But actually, uh, Knight Frank uh, did a study where in the last decade, roughly since QE began, uh, art prices have gone up by more than 250%. Uh, and classic car values have gone up by around 500%. Uh, so in other words, there is inflation, uh, it's just in different areas. And of course, high-end London housing, uh, all of these types of areas which benefit from essentially the financial sector being subsidized through all of this cheap credit. Uh, another instance of a Cantillon effect would be the European Central Bank with its bond buying program. So when they say they only want to buy high quality corporate debt, uh, what they mean is big corporations. So the European Central Bank creates trillions of euros and buys up the debt of very large corporations. It's essentially a subsidy, but it's also a Cantillon effect. Those corporations will start to pull in resources from the rest of the economy because they're benefiting from this money creation. So in fact, actually, uh, generalized inflation is not the most damaging effect of, of money creation. But the distortions caused and the transfers of wealth from different groups of the economy to the receivers of this new money is the most damaging effect. Last year, uh, I had the pleasure of giving a speech in Leipzig uh, at the Commerce Bank headquarters on these themes. And um, if anyone here is a fan of German literature, uh, you may be aware that it's Leipzig 
that is where Faust takes his first sojourn with Mephistopheles uh, in Goethe's great work of Enlightenment literature. But relevant for us today, actually, is an episode that happens a little later, uh, at the beginning of Faust Part Two, <laughs> where the emperor is lamenting his lack of funds. The empire is going bankrupt, and Mephistopheles comes to the emperor and suggests that he create essentially a debt-based monetary system. So he will create money out of thin air, uh, based on gold that has not yet been discovered in the ground. But the emperor, of course, uh, replies to him, I'm sick and tired of how and when. We're short of money, so make it then. <laughs> and what happens is a huge economic boom. Money is suddenly plentiful. The shops are full and the speculators are lending. And the chancellor is ecstatic. See and hear the scroll, heavy with destiny, that's changed to happiness, our misery. To whom it concerns, may you all know, this paper's worth a thousand crowns or so. The chancellor then congratulates the emperor on his brilliant new economic policy based on money creation. So all might benefit from your good deed. We stamp the whole series with your screed. Tens, thirties, fifties, hundreds, all are done. You can't think how well the folk get on. See your city once half dead with decay. Now all's alive, enjoying its new day. Though your names long filled the world with glee, they've never gazed at it so happily. Now the alphabet's superfluous. In these marks, there's bliss for all of us. But of course, what happens following this is the economic collapse of the empire, because it's based on artificial credit creation. And essentially, much of the Western world over the last generation has had a Faustian pact with our central banks and the banking system. Every time there's a recession, we just create a larger and larger debt bubble with lower and lower interest rates. But unfortunately, this is going to be coming to an end over the next few years, much as it did in the empire in Goethe's Faust. Now, I started today with a quote from Claudio Borio, uh, chief monetary economist at the BIS who said, debt was at the root of the financial crisis and it has risen further globally in relation to GDP since then. So again, if we, if we examine some of the causes of this, um, if we look at Venezuela, where they set the price of food and other products, we're not surprised when we see empty shelves in the supermarkets. So if central banks set interest rates at 0% for years on end, we should not be surprised that we have a $250 trillion global debt bubble. You can't have an economy based on stuffing consumers with more and more debt like foie gras. But unfortunately, I think when this next crisis hits, really the only place for central banks to go will be the final reductio ad absurdum of this entire system, which is negative interest rates. And finally, the, uh, the Austrian school has actually given a lot to mainstream economics, including opportunity cost, uh, marginal utility, among other theories. But I think the key lesson that mainstream economics can learn from the Austrian school today is that just like other prices and other sectors of the economy, we should not have uh, committees of government economists and bureaucrats setting interest rates. It's doomed to failure. So let's hope that the economics establishment can learn this lesson from the Austrian school before it's too late. Thank you very much.